once again, Hope Community Church. Uh, my name, once again, is Nathaniel Lyon. I'm the lead pastor here at Hope Community Church. It is wonderful to be here with you all. For those of you who are checking us out online, thanks for checking it out. It's lovely to be in community with you all as well. We are back for week two of our series called Death to Hurry. And uh, I got uh, to speak with several of you about the beginning of this. And the general consensus is this is hard. <laughs> and if you uh, get the e-newsletter, you saw a quick video from me that I preached a sermon on Sunday about needing to slow down and be more present. And the very next morning, I got up late and I rushed through time with my kids and I was hurried and I was frantic and it wasn't even 8 a.m. yet. It's hard. This is hard work, but we can do it together. So before we jump into week two of our series, and I know that this has come up multiple weeks already, and I'm so sorry if you're tired about it. I'm tired of it already also, but I feel like part of my role as a pastor is to help the church interpret and understand the things that are happening in the world around them. And I think some of the reasons that we are where we are today in the world is because the church has been afraid to speak about certain things in church. So the only voices that are talking about it are not the church's voice. So I promise this is not who I am, but I have to say this. <laughs> we have an election on Tuesday. We have an election on Tuesday. I heard some what? <laughs> we have an election on Tuesday. And I need church for you to understand and be with me on this. Because everyone this week will put pressure on you to tell you that everything in the world hinges upon the outcome of this election that's coming on Tuesday. But church, as a follower of Jesus, we know that that is a lie. The world does not hinge upon the results of this election. The results does not hinge upon who sits in the White House. The world does not hinge on it. Our allegiance goes beyond a political party. Our hope goes beyond a political party. Our hope goes beyond a governmental office. So I need, church, for you to be with me and with the church to remember that no matter what happens on Tuesday or at the end of the week or whenever the heck we find out this, the results of this election... That you will be with me along with the rest of the church in remembering that no matter what happens, church, our hope is still intact. And church, listen, listen. No matter what happens on Tuesday, our job, our mission as the church of God remains exactly the same. And this is, I didn't say this yesterday, but I'm going to today. Okay, this might step on some people's toes. I need you to understand this too. As I talk to people, there seem to be two big issues that land people on opposing sides of this election. And I need you to hear me on this. And I'm sorry about stepping on your toes. Come find me afterwards. We'll talk about it. It seems to me two big issues are racial equality and justice and being pro-life over pro-choice. And those two issues are what center around everything, and they land people often on opposite sides of the aisle. But what I need you to understand, church, is that Jesus cares about both of those things, one. Two, what I need you to understand is if your advocacy for that cause, which I believe is a good cause for Christ, ends at casting a vote, you are not doing enough. You are saying, I'm just casting a vote and letting somebody else take care of it. But church, listen to me. Racial inequality has been a problem in this country since its founding. And we've had Republicans in office and Democrats in office and Whigs in office. And it's been a problem. And listen, church, Roe v. Wade has been law in this country for 50 years and there's been Republicans in office, and there's been Democrats in office. Church, if we as the church do not step in to tangibly do something, it does not matter who's in office. It doesn't. And so whether your guy wins on Tuesday or your guy loses, your job as a follower of Christ is exactly the same. 
And does it matter who's in office to help us accomplish things? Absolutely it does. Politics matter. My own father held office in the state of Washington. My brother ran for office. I'm a believer. Politics matters. But no matter who wins, our job is the same and our hope remains intact. Are you with me on that, church? All right. So when everything starts going down, I need, to, I need to just call you back. That church, we are still the church. And we will not be woe is me and we will not be the earth is on fire because our hope is in something greater than this election. Okay, that's done now. Okay, now we're going to jump into what we're actually talking about today. Thank you for bearing with us. We had to talk about the business meeting. I threw in an extra thing. It's been a lot. We're actually going to talk about this death to hurry thing. All right. Do you guys remember boredom? (laughs) You guys remember what it's like to be bored? (laughs) You know, like when you're just riding in a long car ride before technology and you can't read in the car because you get car sick and so you just stare out the window and watch fields go by. You know, boredom where you're looking at clouds and trying to determine what shapes they are. (laughs) Boredom. We have to make up games just to entertain yourself. Or boredom when you have to torture your little brother or sister because what else is there to do? (laughs) Boredom when you're complaining to your parents and your mom just says, just go outside. I don't care. Just leave my presence. Go outside and do something. (laughs) When you're standing in line at the coffee shop and you, you know, like talk to somebody else in line. Or if you're like my wife, you stay in line at the coffee shop and pray that nobody talks to you in line. (laughs) Boredom, that feeling of not having anything to do. And I know I'm making jokes about it, but it feels kind of like boredom has been eradicated from our society because all of us have the World Wide Web in our pockets at all times. And the moment you start to be bored, you reach into your pocket and you start going down like this. And the minute you start to be bored in the car, you're not looking at the clouds anymore. Now you're watching a video. And the minute you get bored in the coffee shop line, you're not talking to other people. You're down here like this. And I know boredom seems like a silly thing to be nostalgic about, right? If if we could travel through time and we brought seven-year-old Nathaniel to this time, and we're like, Nathaniel, guess what, buddy? Boredom doesn't exist here. He'd be like, what? 2020 must be the best year ever. (laughs) I don't know. Slow down, kid. Slow down. (laughs) I know, it's a silly thing to be nostalgic about. But I think an unintended consequence of us eliminating boredom from our lives is that we have also lost the ability to be present to anything. Doesn't it feel like we're always distracted? Like we can never fully be present in anything that we're doing or with anyone that we're with? Family dinners turn into we're all sitting at the same table looking at our own screens. (laughs) Family car rides turn into everybody has their own headphones in. (laughs) These kids will never have to listen to the golden oldie station like I did. (laughs) What would they do without the Jackson 5 greatest hits cassette tape? (laughs) We've lost our ability to be present with each other with ourselves, and with God, because we're all so distracted. I remember when I was a kid, uh, everybody's fear, everybody who's my parents' age, uh, which some of you guys uh, would be of that generation, everybody who's my parents' age were so terrified that the TV was going to ruin us, right? It was going to rot our brains, and everything was about how much TV you let your kids watch, and maybe they were on to something, but I'll tell you, embarrassingly, in my house, my wife and I have had to set a rule that we put our phones away at a certain time each night just so we can all pay attention to the same screen at night, right? <laughs> like, we're so distracted, we can't even all look at the same screen. We have our own screens doing our own thing all the time. We're so distracted, we can't be present. And so today, we're going to talk about what does it mean to wake up to our souls and truly be present in each 
moment that we're alive, and it starts with silence and solitude is our first practice for the series. But before we get in there, I need to give you guys two reminders that we'll come back to throughout this whole series, okay? There's two reminders. The first one is this. This. Okay, there's a difference between having enough to do and having too much to do. And I think this was on me last week. I didn't talk about this enough, but I had some comments from people talking about the, their schedule and lives and be like, hey, what am I supposed to do here? Like, I just have a lot to do. And you don't need to feel bad about having a lot to do. Jesus himself was pretty busy, had a lot to do, but Jesus was never in a hurry. He never had too much to do. He always knew how to say no to prevent him from being overwhelmed with hurry, right? C.S. Lewis, who I love, C.S. Lewis says, who you are in the middle of an interruption is who you truly are. Who you are in an interruption is who you truly are. And I think that's such a good barometer of whether or not you're in a hurry in your life. How do you handle interruptions? When you're working on something and somebody interrupts you, how do you respond? I think this quote matters a lot to me because I usually respond poorly, which is a sign that my soul's in a rush. Who are you in the middle of an interruption? Because look, if you look through the the stories about Jesus' life, half the stories that we love to talk about with Jesus are interruptions. He's on his way to go do something, and somebody just walks up in the middle of it and starts talking to him. And he always pauses to be present in the moment with that person. So you don't need to feel bad about having much to do, but having too much to do. The second reminder is this. It's about practice, not perfection. We will keep talking about this for days on end throughout this whole series. This is not about perfection. We, if you're like me, you will get this how to unhurry packet and you'll take it home and you'll see the four exercises and you'll treat it like a quiz and you'll try to pass it. (laughs) But it's about practice. This is unnatural for all of us. This is a weird thing for all of us. It's going to take work. It will take practice. It will feel awkward at first because you're not used to doing it. But over time, it will become more natural. And so just know, this is about practice. It's about celebrating the work that we can do, not about doing it absolutely perfectly. The author of the book that we're following along with, John Mark Comer, says, um, start where you are, not where you think you should be. (laughs) Just start where you are. There's no shame in that. Start where you are, not where you think you should be. So with those reminders out of the way, we're going to talk about silence and solitude today. So silence and solitude, if you're familiar with the traditional spiritual disciplines uh, in some form, these often are listed there. It's about being quiet and still alone with God. And I want to build a case for you today that not only is this just good practice, but this was something that was very important to Jesus himself. And the theme of each of our messages week by week so far since I've been the lead pastor is, is let's look at the words of Jesus, let's look at the life of Jesus, and let's try to live our lives the same way. So there's this cool story in Matthew chapter 3 where Jesus is, is getting ready to begin his ministry and he goes down to the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing people as a Baptist does. And he's baptizing people in the Jordan River. And Jesus comes forward and he says, hey, John, I I need to be baptized. And John says, hey, I I don't know about that, Jesus. Like, I feel like you should be doing it. And he's like, no, I need to be baptized. And so John says, okay. And he baptizes him in the Jordan River. And Jesus comes up out of the water and it says, the heavens opened up. And the Spirit descends like a dove upon Jesus, and a voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And there's this incredible moment in Scripture where for one of the first and most evident times, Jesus is named as God incarnate. And we celebrate, and there's this majestic moment. And then Matthew chapter 3 ends... And Matthew chapter 4 begins this way. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. So there's this incredible moment where the Spirit descends like a dove and God says, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. This big, huge, spiritual, high, mountaintop moment. And then the very next thing that happens is he's led by the Spirit interesting, 
into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I think oftentimes we read this story, if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this story, you've probably even heard the connection between those two events, that right after Jesus' baptism he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and we read it like, man, ain't that like the devil? But right when we're feeling good, he drags us off into the wilderness and tempts us for 40 days and 40 nights without food. He finds us in our most high points and drags us down to the weakest point where we're most vulnerable so that he can try to tempt us into doing something we know we ought not to do. And that's how we've taught it. But here's something I want to tell you. The word that's translated to wilderness in this passage, uh, other places, if you have a different inter, uh, translation of Scripture, it's often desert. Uh, but, but the word that, that's used there is called aremos. And it doesn't always mean wilderness. Sometimes it means desert, deserted place. It can also mean solitary place or lonely place or quiet place. And it's used all throughout Scripture. And, and I'm going to show you about the other places, some other places that it's used in Scripture as it relates to Jesus. And I want to pitch to you a hypothesis that perhaps, perhaps we've missed something important about this story when it comes to the Aramos that's mentioned here. You see, we've always interpreted it as the Aramos, the wilderness, as a place of weakness. But I'm going to make a case as you see where Aramos comes up in Jesus' life again and again, that perhaps what Jesus was onto, what the Spirit was onto as it led him into the wilderness, is that the Aramos can be a place of strength. Perhaps what Jesus understood is not that it's weakness, but that it's only after 40 days of fasting and prayer and time alone with the Father could his connection to the Father be so strong that he could stand up to the temptation of the devil himself. Perhaps we've been reading the story wrong that being alone in prayer and fasting is not a moment of weakness, but it's a moment of strength. And what Jesus understood is that even more than my body needs nourished, my soul needs nourished. And for me to be in my strongest, most healthy point actually means being in the Aramos with the Father in prayer. You see, because this word Aramos keeps coming up in Jesus' life in other places, in other stories that you've probably read before, and you've thought, man, isn't that cool that Jesus is going off to go do that? And we're going to talk about him. So in Mark chapter 1, there's this big, Mark chapter 1 is a long chapter, and it, and it begins towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it talks about this whole passage that we already read about, where Jesus is baptized, and he's led off, and he's tempted by the devil, and he comes back. And it starts talking about the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 1. And it says he gets up early, and he teaches in the synagogue, and then after he teaches, he heals some people, and then they go over to Peter's mother-in-law's house, and she's sick, and he heals them, and then she cooks them a big brunch, and they hang out together. And then it says he goes back to healing the sick and casting out demons until after sunset. Big, long day, teaching, healing, more healing, eating a little bit, more healing, casting out demons until after sunset. A long day. And I'll tell you, as somebody who often teaches, without all of the healings and casting outs of demons following it, just doing some teaching can be an exhausting day. Where the next day you just want to like sleep in and have a nice big brunch and eat some French toast. And hang out with your people. See, often after we have a big, long, hard day, what we think we need to do is kick back and relax and take it easy. And do, but what does Jesus do after his big, long day? What does Jesus say? This is the thing that will restore my soul. This is what happens in Mark chapter 1. It says, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place, an Aramos, to pray. See, after this big, long day, when most of us would say, hey, when all that's done, all I want to do is just collapse into my bed and stay in a coma for the next 13 hours, Jesus says, no, you know what's actually best for me? Is to get up early the next day and go be in the Aramos, a quiet place with my Father. That's what will restore me. That's what will gear me up for another day. You see, after this story, Jesus is up there praying, and the disciples come find him, and they say, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. There's so much more to do. we got to get back to town. 
And Jesus comes down and says, hey, no, we actually need to travel somewhere else so that I can preach to them. You see, it was after Jesus spent all this time in the Aramos, he came out of that prayer time with such clarity of vision who he was, what he needed to do, what he needed to not do. And it came from this moment in the Aramos, this time with the Father. And as we keep reading the Gospels, it continues to come up. In Mark chapter 6, this word Aramos comes up again earlier in the chapter. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus sends out the apostles two by two. He says, I give you the power to heal, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel. Go out across the world two by two. And they go out and preach. And then Jesus does some other things in the middle. And we come back around towards the end of the chapter. And the apostles come back. And this is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 6. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place, a ramos, to rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place, a ramos, where they could be alone. Once again, we see this contrast where the disciples were sent off two by two to do the great work of ministry, and they go out and teach and heal, and they come back. And what does Jesus say? Is he, he doesn't say, hey, you guys need a night out. Why don't you kick back? Go out on the town. He doesn't say, hey, what you guys need to do is go sleep in. He doesn't say, hey, what you guys need is to pound a pint of ice cream. <laughs> but what he says is, hey, Man, what awesome work God has done. We need to go find some time in a quiet place where we can be alone with the Father. So they got into a boat to go find a quiet place. But check out what happens. Many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Ain't that how it goes where that moment when you're like, man, I need to get away to be alone with the Father. I need to spend some time in silence and solitude and prayer and scripture with my God. And the moment you crack open that Bible, bam, an emergency at work you got to go respond to. Bam, your kid swallows a Lego and you got to go to the emergency room. Bam. You realize that you don't have any food at your house and you got to go to the grocery store. Bam, there's something that happens. Bam, 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 bam. Right when you're sitting down to do that incredible work to be alone with the Father, an emergency comes up and you have to take care of it. If that's ever happened to you, you're not alone. That happened to Jesus too where he's saying, I need to get to the Aramos to be alone with my Father. But then something comes up. And Jesus teaches them. And then right after this, this is where Jesus feeds the 5,000 miraculously. Because sometimes things come up, and I think all of that makes sense to us this far. Hey, sometimes we want to get to the Ramos. We know that we need to spend time with God, but things just come up, and we got to take care of it. So we do. And Jesus did. We're with Jesus so far. But I think there becomes a departure from what Jesus would do and what we do, because listen to what happens after that. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. Well, he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. See, I think that's where we depart from Jesus. What happens for us is we recognize that we need to be alone with the Father, so we set up a time to do it, and then an emergency comes up, and we take care of it. And Jesus says, after taking care of that emergency, he says, okay, now I need to be alone with the Father. But too often with us, We take care of the emergency and say, dang, I missed out on that alone time with God today. But Jesus is saying, hey, even after this is done, my soul still needs to be with the Father. And immediately after this passage, it says Jesus was alone on land while they're in a boat. The next verses describe when Jesus walks out on water to the disciples while they're out in the middle of the lake. And it says that happens at 3 in the morning. Friends, listen, that means that Jesus did this big, long 
sprint where he was healing people. He taught people. He miraculously fed 5,000 people. He said, you guys go on ahead. I'm going to stay here. And he prays until three in the morning and then walks out to his disciples. What Jesus understood is, yes, my body is tired and I need sleep. But what I need even more is to make sure that I'm maintaining a connection with my father. Because if I don't have that, then all is lost. Jesus had prioritized time in prayer alone with the Father above even sleep. And obviously that's not functional. We can't all just say, yes, I'm never going to sleep. I'll just pray all night, every night. It's not how it works. But when you have that time set aside and something comes up, it does not mean that we are best to forego that time with the Lord. It means that we need to find another time and give up something else that's important to do it. So I have one more passage about Jesus in the Aramos, and I promise I'll be done. But I just want to highlight for you how important this was to Jesus because consistently throughout his life, he often was found going to withdraw to the Aramos. And this one's from Luke. But then we've got three Gospels hit, and Aramos comes up in all of them as they're talking about Jesus' life. And what happens in Luke chapter 5 is Jesus is healing people as he does, and he consistently is telling people, hey, guys, please don't tell anyone. Just keep it a secret. But of course they don't. They go tell everybody. And here's what happens, Luke chapter 5. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster. The vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness, Aramos, for prayer. Luke uses the word Aramos in, in relationship to Jesus more than nine times as Jesus often was retreating to prayer. If you read through Luke's gospel, it seems like there's this parallel between the busier Jesus got, the more he needed to go into the Aramos to pray. But isn't it opposite with our lives? The more busy that we get, the more easy it is to cut that out of our lives. I'll tell you, church, as I was preparing for this message, I myself was convicted as I was reading that story about Jesus staying up until three in the morning praying, giving up even sleep to spend time with the Father. And I thought to myself, I need to be better at that for my soul. (laughs) You see, if you keep looking at your life and wishing that you could connect with God more deeply, but then you find that you keep substituting out your time alone with God for something else, no wonder you don't feel connected to God. And so this week, I dragged my behind out of bed at 6 a.m. because I said to myself, what's more important here, 6 to 6.30 of sleep, 30 minutes of sleep, or 30 minutes of alone time with my father? What's going to matter more to my day, to my soul, to my heart, to myself? 30 minutes of sleep or this time with my father? And I bring all of those things up, and hopefully by now you understand that when we talk about working silence and solitude into our lives, it's not just a good idea, but it is a practice that was important to Jesus. This is something that Jesus felt like he needed to do, to be alone in silence and solitude with the Father. And listen, church, if Jesus needed to be alone with the Father to maintain a strong connection with him, So do you. (laughs) If Jesus needed time in the Aramos, so do you. To restore your soul. To restore your hope. So we're going to talk about how do we do that in our modern context. And I'm not going to get into tons of specifics because much of that is in the How to Unhurry workbook that you can grab online or in person today. But I want to lay out just kind of the philosophy behind this. The first thing is silence. Silence. And we have external and internal silence. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but there is so much external noise in the world right now, right? There is noise all the time, everywhere. We cannot go 30 minutes in our lives without our phones making noise or without checking our screens for something or watching TV or hearing a noise or we get into the car and the first thing we do is turn on the radio. How often in your life is there just true Quiet with nothing. No external noise. 
I think it's becoming an epidemic. I spent the last seven and a half years as a youth pastor, and we would encourage our students to do quiet time. And literally, almost to the person, they interpret quiet time as sitting by themselves in a room listening to worship music. And that's not bad, but that's not quiet. (laughs) That's still noise that you're listening to. We have lost this ability to even sit in silence. And I think part of the reason is because of that pesky internal silence, right? I think for many of us, we need the noise, we need the external noise as a distraction because the minute that we have to sit in external silence, the internal noise gets cranked to 11. And all of a sudden, the moment that it gets quiet around us and our brains aren't distracted from it, all of a sudden, this internal noise creeps up. And it's all of the parts of us that we don't want to deal with. It's our past that's hard and gross and yucky and we don't want to think about it. It's those thoughts that we've had that we know that we shouldn't have and we don't want to mess with it. It's that thing that's giving us stress and anxiety and we want to be distracted from it because we don't want to mess with it. It's anger, it's revenge, it's resentment, it's hurt, it's depression, it's sadness, it's anxiety, it's stress. And the moment that the external noise shuts off, the internal noise cranks up. And we use external noise to push it back down. But to be in silence means that we have to learn how to manage both. And I truly believe that though it will be hard at first, if you turn off the external noise and start to deal with your internal noise, it will feel like a flood at first. That over time, you can learn how to manage that in a healthy way to where you don't have to be distracted all the time to avoid dealing with your own self. But you can learn how to manage it and lay it before the Lord And that internal noise can just be brought out in front of God in a safe environment. And we need to find true silence, external and internal, to be with God. The next one is this, solitude. That one's simple. Be alone. Just be alone. And I know that's scary for some of us. And some of us are not confident enough in our own faith to even feel like we know how to be alone with God. We need someone to walk us through it. But I promise you, if you are alone with God listening for him, he will help you figure it out. (laughs) To be alone. Last week I used the example of being in a marriage. And I think it holds true here too. Can you imagine a marriage where you and your spouse were never alone, just the two of you ever? That doesn't work. In a marriage, you have to have that time alone together to have big conversations, intimate conversations, to talk about dreams and hopes and failures, to talk about the hard stuff, to dream together, to cry together, to do some other things together that married people do. You have to be alone to do that. And our relationship with God is the same. There are certain levels of intimacy that you can only experience when you are alone with someone. So we need to turn off the noise and be alone with God. So as you guys know, this whole series is birthed out of a book that I read and what I have experienced and learned from reading it called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. And I thought about trying to write this out my own way, but I love the way that he framed it so much that I'm just going to read for you his description of what's at stake here for us. And it's a pretty long passage, so I'm sorry to the publishing company. I don't know what copyright laws are about how much I'm allowed to quote before it's illegal, but we're just going to go for it. And I'm going to read for you. This is what's at stake. And listen to these paragraphs because I know for me as I was reading through these paragraphs about what's at stake if we do not find silence and solitude with the Lord, what happens to our souls. And these paragraphs resonated with me because I started to see those things in myself. And this is what he says. We feel distant from God and we end up living off somebody else's spirituality via podcast feed or book or one-page devotional that we read before we rush out the door to work. See, when we don't have time for silence and solitude with the Lord, what happens is we're just desperate to pick up somebody else's faith. Well, what do they say about that? Okay, that's what I think too. Well, how did they experience God? Well, that's how I experienced it too. Hey, well, what did they say about that passage? Well, that's what I say about it too. And we don't actually truly have our own faith. We've just picked up somebody else's faith and we claim it like our own. 
We feel distant from ourselves. We lose sight of our identities and callings. We get sucked into the tyranny of the urgent, not the important. Does anybody in this room feel like you've been working at the same job for 5, 10, 15, 30 years and you feel like it's totally disconnected you from your soul and your identity and who God has called you to be and you're just coasting through it and you've totally forgotten this person that you know God created you to be and you feel like everything that you're doing does not speak to it at all. But you're lost in accomplishing the things that are directly in front of you instead of doing the things that you know are good for your soul. We feel an undercurrent of anxiety that rarely, if ever, goes away. This sense that we're always behind, always playing catch-up, never, never done. Does anybody else resonate with that? That anxiety just is lurking behind you at all times? That you never feel like you're finished? You always feel like you're behind? Every Monday you get there and you look at your to-do list and you're like, that's another Monday I'm behind. And you hope that by the time you get to Friday you feel caught up, but you go home on the weekend Friday feeling like you didn't get enough done. And so then Saturday all you can do is think about how much more you have to get done. It continues. Then we get exhausted and we wake up and our first thought is already, I can't wait to go back to bed. We lag through our days on low-grade energy, on loan from our stimulants of choice. Even when we catch up on our sleep, we feel a deeper kind of tired. Does anybody else know that life when you wake up in the morning and all you can think about is crashing back into bed? Or you're just trying to get through the day because that's all you have the energy for. Then we turn to our escapes of choice. We run out of energy to do what's actually life-giving for our souls. Say prayer. And instead we turn to the cheap fix, another glass of wine, a new show streaming online, our social media feeds, or porn. All of a sudden we realize that the energy that we have isn't doing it for us, but it feels like the things that we know are good for our souls just require too much energy that we don't have. So instead we turn to this thing that we think will fix us or make us feel better in the meantime, but it ends up just making us feel worse at the end of it. Have you ever spent time watching Netflix for four hours and then thought to yourself, Man, I just am ready to take on the day now. But that's what we do. And he continues on. We become easy prey for the tempter, just furthering our sense from distance from our God and our souls. Then emotional unhealth sets in. We start living from the surface of our lives, not the core. We're reactionary. The smallest thing is a trigger, a throwaway line from the boss, a snide comment from a coworker, a suggestion from a spouse or roommate. It doesn't take much. We lose our tempers, bark at our kids, get defensive, sulk, feel angry or sad, often both. Does anyone else feel like everywhere that you go, somebody's out to just get you and everybody's making you angry and you're very reactionary and all you can do is snap at your kids probably because they distracted you from your Twitter feed. continues on. Oh, that's the next one. I'm sorry. Do you see, that's when we flip it. Do you see what's at stake here? Did any of those paragraphs resonate with you? Maybe it was this idea that my faith is not really my own, but I'm coasting on somebody else's because all I have time for is to listen to a podcast while I'm driving to work. Do you resonate with this idea that you're always tired and you're always behind? Do you resonate with this idea that all you can do is come home on a Thursday night and escape to this easy fix to try to make you feel better? It's a coping mechanism to help you process the despair that you feel in your lives because you're exhausted. And we know that there's other ways to do it, but we don't have the energy. That's what's at stake. But check out what can happen when we prioritize our souls, when we prioritize the aramos with the Lord. Here's what happens. It says, we find our quiet places, a park down the street, a reading nook at home, a morning routine that begins before the little ones are awake, and we come away. We take our time. Maybe it's not a full hour, but we're there long enough to decompress from all the noise and traffic and stress and nonstop simulation of our modern society. Sometimes all we need is a few minutes, other times an hour isn't enough, other times we gratefully take what we can get. But it's about this idea that in our routines we work in every single day, some silence and solitude with the Lord because we have to disconnect, unplug, and decompress from the pressures and noise and stress and hurry of the world around us and sit still for a minute. He continues on. We slow down, breathe. Come back to the present, where we're not worried about what's happening later this week. 
where we're not stressing about what happened before, but we come back to this present moment with God and who he is and how much he loves us and how he sees us. We start to feel At first, we feel the whole gamut of human emotions, not just joy and gratitude and celebration and restfulness, but also sadness and doubt and anger and anxiety. Usually, I feel the lousy emotions first. I'm the same way. And I love, he finishes with this. He says, we face the good, the bad, the ugly in our own hearts. We worry our, depress- our worry, our depression, our hope, our desire for God, our lack of desire for God, our sense of God's presence, our sense of his absence. Our fantasies, our realities, all the lies we believe and the truth we come home to. Our motivations, our addictions, the coping mechanisms we reach for just to make it through. All is exposed and painfully so, but rather than leaking out on those we love most, it's exposed in the safe place of the Father's love for us. You see, what silence and solitude does is it doesn't make every bad thing go away, but it allows us to deal with them, to deal with the brokenness in our lives in a place that is so safe, where it's met with grace. And instead of it leaking and seeping out onto the relationships that matter most to us, it's presented to a God who says, let me pick that up for you. And he says this, in our ears we hear In our ears, we sense the voice cut through the cacophony of all the other voices, which slowly fade to the deafening roar of silence. In that silence, we hear God speak his love over us, speak our identities and callings into being. We get his perspective on life and our humble, good places in it. When we reserve time for silence and solitude with the Lord, we start to truly understand once again who we truly are. And we start to see this world, this life, the people around us, the way that God sees it and them. And the anxiety and the stress starts to melt away. And all of the things that we thought we had to get done start shifting into the things that truly are important. And that's what's at stake. So this whole series, each week, we will have these How to Unhurry journals. And each week there will be exercises that you can put into place to help you practice these spiritual disciplines. So this week there's four exercises on how to unhurry, how to be in silence and solitude with the Lord. I just want to remind you once again, start where you are, not where you think you should be. There's four exercises and some of you will try to pass it like a quiz. But just do what you can do and celebrate every step towards Christ. These are spiritual disciplines Think about what a discipline is. Think about the discipline of working out. You can't just show up at the gym on your first day and bench press 300 pounds. It doesn't work. But over time, as you continue to show up for the same practice, day in, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, all of a sudden you're lifting more and more weight and you're able to accomplish something that you didn't believe you were able to accomplish before. And the same thing is true for these spiritual disciplines. As you continue to practice, it will feel awkward at first. And it might hurt a little bit. Think about your first day going back to the gym after you haven't been for a long time. Your body hurts so bad. It's awkward and it might hurt a little. But over time, you'll build up that strength and your soul will come alive and you'll experience God in ways that you didn't know you could experience him before because you continue to show up day in, day out, week in, week out. So this week, it's going to be hard and that's okay. But stick with it. Spend some time in the Aramos with the Lord, your quiet place. And watch your soul wake up again. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are who you are. And then once again that you sent Jesus Christ, God incarnate, to come down and give up everything for us. But God, once again, we thank you for the model that he set for us on what it truly means to be human. And God, we chase after that vision of how we can live life best with you. So God, today we come broken and hurting and hurried, but God, we give it to you. We just pray that this week we would find time for silence and solitude to be present with you. 
God, we love you. Amen.